John's Gospel, chapter 15, we're going to start in verse, um, we'll start in verse 14, and we'll, we'll go right into verse 15. You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all the things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should, you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask in the Father, in my name, ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, rather, yet you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my father's name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come, rather, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without cause. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We just ask you, Lord, that you would just, um, just be with us here this morning, Lord, that you would just give us your word. Lord, that you would just give us our portion. We, just, we, we lift up a special prayer for our pastor, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you would heal him, comfort him. And you would just um, during the, give him some time of rest, Lord, some much needed and deserved time of rest today, Lord, Father, as he um, just kind of nurses himself back to health, Lord. We just pray that now, even now, you would, spread, you would send the spirit of comfort, Lord, there to just, uh, just witness to him, Lord, and just keep him, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, yeah, a lot, of, um, a lot of sickness going around. I hear a lot of people coughing, a lot of, you know, it's just going around. So just be... Be cognizant, be aware that um, I just, I would just tell you, uh, don't fellowship with each other, don't shake hands with each other, just leave afterwards. I'm, I'm only kidding, I'm only joking. Just be careful, just have a gallon of sanitizer in your car like I do. All right, John 15, this is a, um, what we've heard is the, this is kind of coming off on the heels of, um, of the true vine. Um, discourse. It's kind of when he, when, when uh, Jesus would go to his disciples, and he's kind of writing them their his his last wishes for them. And I, I equated it in the first service. I equated it to um, kind of the what you would what a parent would tell their children if they were going away on a long journey and they weren't going to be back. He, he's kind of settling some things. And even now, I, you know, as when my parents, here I am close to 40 years old, when my parents go away, when there's, when there's things that they're doing, they make sure they call me, they tell me where the money is, they make sure they tell me where the will is, they make sure they tell me where, where everything is, just so if, heaven forbid, something would happen to them, I know where everything is, I know what to do, you know, and we just, you know, I can, whatever, just take care of business. That's kind of the heart behind what Jesus is doing here. This is the heart of his, his passion. This is the final moments where, he, where he's, he knows he's about to be turned over. He knows he's about to be unlawfully arrested. He knows that he's about to um, be crucified. He knows he's about to go and, and lay down his life, literally lay down his life for his friends. And what he says in the, in the previous verses is that there's no greater love has any man but than he who lays down his life for his friends. And he no longer calls us servants. We're not, we're not just servants. We're not far off. We're not distant. He calls us friends. He calls us close. Friends are, are people that you confide in and people that you can relate to, people that you can really bring in close. And that's, that's who he calls us. Now, we have this incredible access. We have this incredible access to a living and the true God, the creator of heavens and the earth, the one who is the one who spoke everything that we know into existence, we've got this type of relationship now where it's not just where, you know, 
Whereas in most other religions, in most other secular or, or carnal or worldly gods, it's you're, you're trying to appease them by doing things. You're trying to appease the gods. And in ancient cultures, there was, you know, there was sacrifices made, animal, the animal sacrifices, which would then turn into human sacrifices of a secular, uh, kind of a secular flavor, a worldly, very wicked flavor. And what they would do is they would try to appease the God, right? They would appease the gods by offering them money and offering them blood and offering them sacrifices. This is not the type of relationship that the living and the true God has with us. He offers himself a living sacrifice, a sacrifice rather. He offered himself a sacrifice for our sins so that we can come in and have a very personal, intimate relationship with the true and living God through claiming the blood and the sacrifice of Christ. So he no longer calls us he no longer calls us from afar off. There's no longer a, a veil of separation, so to speak. There's a, there's a closeness. There's, a, there's an intimacy that we can now have through Christ. And it's miraculous. So he doesn't call us anymore. No longer are we servants, but we're friends. We're friends. And that's what he calls them. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know his master, what his master is doing, rather. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard for my father, I have made known to you. And he's, gonna, he's going to tell us the price of being a friend of Jesus. This, this does come with a price. We gain all things. All right? We gain and we gather all things. You guys, if it's cold in here, we can kill those ACs. We gain and we gather all things. We are, as, as children of God, there is nothing that he will withhold from us for our good. Does that make sense? There's nothing that he's going to hold back from us that will help further his kingdom. As he went in, as he started this discourse off by saying that he was the true vine, that motive of God and the motive of Christ is to see us bear fruit for the glory of God. The motive of God, now hear me again, the motive of God and the motive of Christ is to see us bear fruit for the, for the glory of God and for the glory of his son. And when when we start to produce fruit, he comes along and he starts to prune us and he starts to he cultivate our hearts and he begins to really mold us and shape us and see to it that we're healthy spiritually so that we can do that, so that we can start to bear fruit, so that we can go off and we can start to really reach a lost and dying world for his glory. And that's what he likens this father to, is the vine dresser, the one who comes along that really begins to prune us and prune our lives and he cleans us and takes care of us, equips us as long as we abide in the vine. As long as we stay close to the vine, as long as, and that's who Christ says he is. I am the vine. I am the true vine. If you stay close with me, I will prepare you. I will keep you healthy. I will keep you equipped. I will make sure that you have all the tools necessary to do my will in this age. And that's essentially what he's saying. There's a price that comes with that. There's a price that comes with that. What I said in the first service, I'll say it here. You cannot grow spiritually and grow carnally at the same time. One of the two. You will either grow in your flesh, you will either feed your flesh, and your flesh will grow, your carnal nature will grow, you will continue to just, your, your sin nature will continue to be healthy and vibrant and just ruining your life, or you can grow spiritually. Or you can grow and you stay close to Christ and your spirit, listen, one of the two is going to wither away and die if it's not fed. If your spirit is fed, it will be stronger than your flesh. If your spirit, the spirit part of you, if you're, if you're being led by the spirit, you're reading God's word, you're praying, you're, the, the relationship that you now have with God, the relationship that you have with Jesus is now something that is palpable. It's something that, that is real. And that, that relationship is growing. Man, your spirit man, your, your spirit person will begin to grow and really will begin to have dominance in your life. However, if you're continuously feeding the flesh and feeding the carnal nature, if you're allowing yourself to entertain the things that drew you away from God, then eventually your spirit will wither away. Your spirit will be weak, man. You will be weak in spirit. You won't know how to, how to you, or you will forget, indeed, you will forget how to navigate around the Word of God. You will stop praying. Things in your life will now come under your control. And when that happens, it turns bad. Things in your life will now be left completely and totally and solely. And the Lord is gracious. He will let that happen. He will let that happen just to remind us how much we really do need Jesus. He will let that happen just to remind us how much we really do need to rely solely on the true vine. And as you start to do that, as that relationship begins to get real, you start to draw close to Christ. He starts to cultivate you. The Father starts to cultivate you. Man, your relationship is real. Let's just say, I mean, your relationship with the Lord is booming. 
Things are going really good, man. Things are, you know, you're walking by faith. God has given you just enough. And we go through these seasons where God has just given us just enough. We're surviving. We get clothes on our back. We get a roof over our heads. And we're at a point in our life spiritually where, man, we are cool with that. Man, I just love being with God, hanging out with the Lord. And some of us, we get to these points in our lives where I'm all right, man. You just give me a box and, you know, a jar of pickles and I'm good. I'm happy just knowing Jesus. When you get to that point, if that ever happens, I'm assuming that it's hap- it happens to all of us to some degree, to one level, where we get to a point where we just, we're just happy knowing Jesus. That comes with a price, man. I said it before. And I don't mean a, it's going to cost you, you know, I don't mean that to say that in a threatening way, but it's in a very loving and a very warning way. That when you start to take your walk seriously, listen, I, and I really believe this with all my heart, and, I'm, and you can call me biased if you want to. I am definitely biased to this church and what we stand on and the fact that we preach every word of God. Everything in the Bible, we, we hold to it, and we preach it, we make sure that we just hold fast to it, and not only that, but we disciple people by it. We don't just come up with some crazy philosophies and yada 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 everything that we do we filter through the word of god here we make sure that everybody knows what the word says and how to how to implement that into your life and as a result of that when that starts to happen man people start getting hit the warfare begins to be real i'm not saying that there aren't other bible believing churches around there but i'm biased here because i think we do the most of it and i think we're the best at it (laughs) I'm, I'm, ki- I'm kidding, but I'm not. I'm not kidding. No, but I think that what happens is when you really start to take a stand, when you really start to take a stand for the Lord and you really start to be discipled and you really want to become a true follower of Christ, you start reading the Word of God, you start to let it take root, the seed, the Word of God really starts to take root and starts to show fruit in your life and you're, you're doing it. Man, you just love Jesus and Jesus loves you and as he says in, these, in the prior verses, he's abiding in you, you're abiding in him, things are going great. All of a sudden, look at what happens. You do not choose me in verse 16. He's going he's gonna to tell us, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. Why? Because of left of our own, we would never on our own choose Christ. First John says he loves us We only love him because he first loved us. The only reason why we love him is because he loved us first. The only reason why he's, that we are drawn to him is because he's drawn to us. He called us, he chose us. But that doesn't also, that doesn't oust our responsibility to respond to his love. We have a responsibility to respond to the calling of Christ. But he says, I chose you. I chose you and and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Now here it is. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. That's a bold statement. Hate is a, hate, this word is is a tough word, you know. You ever hear, you know, when we have our children, we have, our, we have kids and they grow up, you know, kids will say things, obviously, they don't even know the, the brevity of what they say. You know, they'll come up to you and they'll say, I hate you. You don't even know where they're with me. They're just angry at you. They don't really hate you. They're just angry. Oh, let's look at another kid and they say, I hate you. You know, they, oh, all right, whatever. You're just mad at each other right now. You'll, you'll be fine in a little while, you know. Fight it out, you know. <laughs> but the word here is a very serious word. The word here, if you, if you guys know anything about biblical, you know, what the word hate means in the Bible, it is, it's, it's the real meaning, the legitimate meaning of the word hate. The, the world is going to hate you. It is going to despise you. It is going to completely, it is going to think you're wretched and there's nothing good about what you believe or what you think. The world is in no doubt, in fact, going to hate you. It is going to literally loathe your very existence. The fact that you love Jesus and Jesus loves you and that you're a child of God is going to cause the world to have an emotion. It's going to look at you and there's going to be something about you that the world is going to hate. You know what I mean? You ever have somebody come up, you, you know, the world, somebody in the world, you're walking with the Lord, you love Jesus, and somebody starts talking behind your back. I don't know what it is about him, but I just don't like him. I don't know what it is, but I just, there's just something, I don't know exactly what it is. I just don't like the way that they're just so happy all the time. 
I just don't like them and their them and their Jesus, and they go to church and they just think that they're better than everybody else. Little do they know that we're the chiefest of sinners. I have to sit there and be like, man, I am I am saved, but I am no doubt a sinner. So the world, the response to what the world, the response of the world to us loving Jesus is going to be hatred. Jesus says this. And the reason why it hates you, the reason why the world hates you, despises your existence, loathes you, cannot stand you, the sight of you makes it sick. That's how much the world hates you. And listen to me, we try to play friends with the world sometimes. We try to play nice. Well, we're not in the world, we're not of the world, we're just, but we do have to live in it. We hear that all the time in Christian circles. Well, we're not of the world, but we do have to live in it, so we have to try and play nice. No, 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 no. You don't have to play nice with the world. You need to win souls. No doubt. Do the work of an evangelist. There's a job for us to do, man. There is a lost and dying world that needs to hear, that needs to hear about Christ. But that doesn't mean that we need to compromise our beliefs or what we know to be true in order to do that. We do not have to compromise our walks. You know, a lot of people will take the they will they will take the scripture that Paul said, I become all things to all men to mean that you literally need to look like the world in order to win the world. And that is not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying at all. He would use the things that God had given him to try and relate to somebody to win them to Jesus. If he was trying to win a Jew, he knew enough about Judaism to convert them. If he, was, if he knew about, he, ra- he was raised in a Greek culture. He knew enough about Greeks to be able to sit there and relate to the Greeks to win them to Christ. But that didn't mean that he would all of a sudden become a Greek or go back to Judaism. He would try to win them to Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. And when you start to do that, listen to me. If you take a firm stand on what you believe, you take a firm stand on what the Word of God says, and you allow it to reign and to rule, and you now are a friend of Jesus, because that's what He calls you, that's what He calls us all, we're friends of Christ. We're not just servants, we're friends. Now all of a sudden the world has a reason to hate you. Now all of a sudden the world has a reason to hate you, because it hated Jesus first. If you're a friend, you need to pick a side. And the world isn't going to let you get away with it either. The world isn't going to let you get away with not picking a side. You're going to have to pick a side. You're going to have to either choose to be a friend of Christ or a friend of the world. Those are the decisions that we need to make. And if you choose Jesus, what he says here very plainly, if you choose, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. When? It's literally when this begins to happen. When you got people in your family who think you're a jerk now because you're a Christian, make no mistake about it. Jesus' family thought the same thing. They thought that he was mad. He's out of his mind. He had brothers and a mother, sisters that would come looking for him, thinking he was loony, calling himself the son of God. Oh, the audacity of this insane Jesus. His name was Joshua. His earthly name was Joshua. Joshua of Nazareth. That's what his name was. What is wrong with Joshua? He is out of his mind. Raising the dead and healing the sick. Psycho. That's what they, listen, you know, praying and calling out to God, calling himself the son of God. That's what they think. And that's what the world is going to think about you. That is what your, your friends, your family, the people who are closest to you, they will undoubtedly think that you're insane. You're giving to the church now? You're giving your hard-earned money to the church? You lunatic. That's what they're going to think. They're going to hate you. The world is going to hate that you, that you are. The world is going to have the same attitude towards you that Paul had towards Christians. The world is going to hunt you down. They want to pull you out. The world is going to want to expose you in your Christianity. The world is going to want to do that. That word hate is exactly what that means. It means that the world is now going to be your enemy because the world is an enemy of God. You understand? It is going to be your enemy. The world is going to hate you. It is going to want to, it is literally going to be at war with you. And I'm going to tell you something. War doesn't come with, without bloodshed. The weapons of our, what is it? Warfare. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. The weapons of our warfare. Now listen, warfare, if you guys know anything about war, if you know anything about the art of war, Man, it is brutal, bloody, messy, and it affects people around you. And it is real. 
It is real. Spiritual warfare is real. I say this a lot. You cannot make friends with an enemy. The only thing that the only thing that the enemy wants to do to you and to your family and to your children, the only thing he wants to do, the only thing he wants to do to marriages, the only thing he wants to do to you and your walk, the best thing for the enemy to have, for the enemy to see, is somebody who knows the truth and who hides the truth within himself. The best thing for the enemy to see is somebody who's saved and useless. The best thing for the enemy to see is somebody who's got all of access to every single heavenly and spiritual power, access to everything that we need to have a successful spiritual life and not use it. He loves that. That's good. Loves that. Loves the, the, the access that we have that we never claim. The, the privilege that we have in prayer to be able to go to a living God who is willing to give us whatever we ask. We just read it. You can, you can hold him to his word. Give us what we ask. Lord, I'm asking for some spiritual deliverance. I need some spiritual power, Lord. I need to be helped. I need to be brought up. I want to be closer to you. I want to, listen, all of these things he's going to do, but make no mistake about it. When he does them and you're really seriously praying for his glory and his, him to be manifest and made more manifest in your life, make no mistake about it. Now the warfare is on. It's on. The world is going to hate you because it hates Jesus. The world system, what he's talking about, he's not talking about the earth. <laughs> he's not talking about the earth and the dirt. He's talking about people in the world system. This world system is going to hate you. There's going to be something about you, man. There's going to be a flag on you. You're, you're marked. Biblically, that's what the Bible says. You're sealed. You're marked. There's, there's something about you spiritually that you cannot see that's on you that sticks out in the world whether it's how you live. Listen, I see people in the world. <laughs> there are people in the world sometimes, and we know this, we, we're in the body of Christ. Sometimes there are people in the world and sometimes they act more like Christians than we do sometimes. And sometimes they're, they're just nice. You ever meet somebody who's just nice? Man, they're just gifted and nice. They're just wicked nice. You walk up to a man and it's just like, man, it's like a warm embrace. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden you tell them they're Christian, you start to see really what they're all about. Oh, that's good. Good for you. See you later. Give me that sandwich back too. <laughs> that's what happens. That's what happens. What happens is the world, there is a, there's an enmity, the Bible will call it. There's a disconnect. Yes, we are not of the world, and yes, we have to live in the world, but let me just tell you something. You do not have to be like the world. You can live in total opposite, in total opposition to the world and the world system. The world that you were saved out of. And what happens is there's so many Christians who refuse the power of this. To refuse the power to walk saved because now there was a way that you were walking that led to death before. There was a way that we were walking that was leading to, with certainty, leading to certain death. And now we've been saved from that. We've been pulled out of the fire. But yet somehow or another, we still want to choose to kind of walk and look and talk and act like the world a little bit. You know, the thing about the children of Israel as they got delivered from Egypt, you know, Moses goes up on a mountain and God tells him that, you know, you need to go back because there's a situation with your people. Your people are starting to worship idols. They're starting to do some things. And they were really getting twisted. They were starting to worship idols and then all of a sudden Aaron gets pulled into the mix too. And I don't know. We threw a bunch of gold in a fire and a cow came out. I don't know what happened. And that's what he starts talking about. And he's talking about the children of Israel and they started going back to doing what they were doing before. But they really weren't doing that. What they were doing is what the Egyptians were doing. You understand? They were children of God, but what they were doing is they were worshiping idols. They had all this gold and silver and they had all this jewelry. Now they, they wanted to do what they saw the world doing that they were a part of before. They wanted to be like the Egyptians. They wanted to be, you know, they were children of God and they were free, right? They weren't slaves anymore, but they, what they really wanted to do was they wanted to start acting like the Egyptians because they saw it. That's what they saw for 400 years. That's what they were around. 
They were watching the Egyptians worship these false gods, and they were just watching the Egyptians really have these lavish lifestyles. They were really living these frivolous, lavish lifestyles, worshiping false gods and just all sorts of sexual promiscuity. There was all sorts of things going on, and they were looking at that, and they wanted that. But yet they wanted God too. They were grateful that they weren't, you know, they were, they, they were, they were like being grateful that they were children of God, but they really still wanted to live like the Egyptians. And this is what happens with us oftentimes. We have no spiritual success in our lives because what we really want to do is we still want to, we want to be Christians, but live like an Egyptian. Remember that song from the Bengals in the 80s? Ah, some of you know what I'm talking about. Ah, we want to walk like an Egyptian man. That's what we want to do. We want to walk like an Egyptian. We, want to, we, we, we love that we're saved. We love the Lord. And we, but we really what we want to do is we want to act like the world. You cannot do that. The world hates you. you there's going to be no friendship with, with the world. There's going to be no peace treaty signed between you and the world. There is nothing that's ever going to cause it to be any warm, fuzzy embrace by the world system that hates Jesus. You can see this publicly all over the place. You, all you got to do is turn on the TV. The world hates Jesus. It is a full-on, I mean, full frontal attack with Christianity in this country. Full-on. The world hates Jesus, hates churches. There's just a, a massive attack, especially from Washington, on us. So what he says is, I know, is it rather, if the world hates you, you know. Now, this is something that you can definitely claim and hang on to. You know. You know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. What he's saying simple. If you were in the world, you would have no issues with the world. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He repeats it. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Keeping the word of God comes with persecution. You hear me? Keeping the word of God comes with persecution. If they persecuted God, that's what he's saying. If they persecuted the creator of the universe... If the world came up against the creator of the living word, put on flesh, veiled in human flesh, man, came to his own and his own received him not. Man, if they didn't receive him, if, they, if the world rejected him and they persecuted him, what are they going to do to us? If they rejected and they persecuted God, what are they going to do to us? There's no question. No question. That we're going to be persecuted. There's no question that the world is going to come up against us. And I hate to say this. There's no question that there are going to be those that are close to us. They're not going to like what we're doing either. There's no question that there are going to be those that, that love us very much. And we love them too. I'm not in, in, a, in a love, in a family love, in a, in a friendship love, in a, in a closeness that we have. There's, there's a love that we have for our friends and our, our loved ones and our family. There are people that we really love, people that we grew up with, man, that we got people that, that are close to us. I got friends who I've been friends with for literally 38 years. I'm 38 years old. People that I've known since I was born. Family that I've grown up with, man, and, there are, and I love them very much. And there is nothing more that I want than to see them get saved. There is nothing more that I want to see God move in their heart and in their life and win them to Christ. That is the that is the passion of my prayers. But they don't like Jesus at all. They don't love him. They don't even want to love him. They don't even want to know him. And there's going to come a point in time, and it has come a point in time in my own life, where I had to distance myself from them. Or God distanced, God distanced them from me. Because they hate Jesus and they hate me. Even now, things are tense. Get around people that you love. Get around family that you love. Things are tense, man. You could cut it with a knife. It is just all of a sudden you get it. It is like just unseen electricity. Bzzz. Man, you just get in between one another and all of a sudden, man, it's like, bah, 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 bah. it's like those, you know, man, it's like a jumper cables immediately in your family. They're like, hey, how you doing? Whatever, Jesus lover. It happens. 
Bible thumping, holy rolling, Jesus freak. Don't judge me. I'm like, dude, I just, I want a bagel. <laughs> it happens. You're laughing because it's true. It is true. <laughs> remember the word. And he says, he calls them to remembrance in something that he says in a couple of verses before and Chapter 13, he says, Remember that I told you, a servant is not greater than the master. If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. If they keep my word, then they're going to keep yours also. But the opposite is also true. Do you understand? If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. But the opposite is also true. If they receive your word, they receive my word. If they receive my word, they're going to receive your word. If, they're, if you're being used by me to deliver the word of God, and you're delivering it to somebody who I've chosen, that person is going to receive you. That person is going to love you. That person is going to be a friend of yours. That person will then no longer just be a friend. That person will be a brother or a sister. Somebody else who's bought and washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ. Who's owned and sealed. This person will receive my word. Then they'll receive your word. Only because they're receiving the word of God. If you're going at it with the word of God. Do you know what an amazing work it is for somebody to be saved? What an amazing work it is to watch somebody transition from death into life. You're a wretched sinner and you're going to hell without Jesus. But you can be saved. And there is, there is light here. You can be saved. You don't have to. Jesus loved the world. Loves you. He loved you so much that he died for you. And when somebody hears that and they respond to that, that's not because you're a great spin doctor. You just got told that you were going to die and go to hell. But then Jesus comes into your life and he witnesses them. The Holy Spirit goes and convicts and comforts them and draws them in. And God does this amazing work and they hear your words because they're hearing the words of God come out of you. They're hearing the word of God, especially when you hit them with scripture. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that none should perish. What an amazing truth. They hear your words. They, if they keep my word, then they're going to keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them. Now he's speaking, he kind of changes gears a little bit here. He's talking about the Pharisees. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have had no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. What's he saying? He's not saying that they're not sinners. What he's not saying is he's not saying that, you know, what you don't want to do is you don't, you know, if I hadn't come and I haven't come and told them the truth, then they would be without sin. No, 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 no. What he's saying is this. I came and I revealed that they were sinners. I came and what I did was I kind of, you know, the Pharisees were walking around in their garb and I just blew the wind up on their garb. <laughs> Lifted the curtain. Lifted the veil. Man, I showed everybody that they were sinners. They didn't respond. I showed them that they were sinners. It's not that they had no sin. I just revealed this sin, but they didn't want to admit it. And listen, this is what separates us. When God really does that, when the Lord comes in and he starts to really just kind of blow open our whole ball game. He really starts to just kick the walls down and just say, okay, all right, we're going to get through all this junk that you're trying to put up. And he gets right down to the heart of the issue. We're going to get right past all this, all this cloaking and trying to hide. And he gets down to us being sinners. And he says, that's what I tried to do with the Pharisees. So they, didn't want to, they didn't want to receive it. He who hates me hates my father. They have no excuse for their sin in verse 22. In verse 23, he who hates me hates my father. They have no excuse. And listen, neither do we. Because when we're, when we're faced with, when, when we're faced with truth, the truth cuts through all of these dividing lines. The truth will cut straight through the cloaks in your heart, the walls we built up to try and hide from God. The truth comes right in, and man, it just cuts straight through us, straight down to the heart. And all of a sudden, we respond to that. The response is our responsibility. Now we respond and we say, man, Lord, you are right. And listen, this happens not just one time. This is a daily routine for me. This is a daily routine. This is a standing order in my life. I got to go to God all the time and say, Lord, 
There is sin going on. I got something going on in my heart. There, man, there's something trapped there. There's something going on. I need to give it to you. I know you see it. I know that the eyes of the Lord are in every place. I know that your word says you look on the heart of men. I know all that. So, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. I'm just going to hand this right over to you because I do not want this thing to sit and to fester. I don't want to be an enemy of God. I want to be a friend. I want to be a son. And our son goes to his father because he says that we can. And I can either trust his word or not. All these things they will do to you. Look at this. All these things they will do to you in verse 21. For my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse, because he made this sin manifest. He who hates me, hates my father also. They're an enemy of God. If I had not, excuse me, if I had not done among them the works, which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. They saw, and they still hated him. But this happened, that the words might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without cause. Now here it is in verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you, from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. That's the Holy Spirit. In fact, this is, the Holy Spirit has many names. I'm going to touch on a couple of them, but this is one of my favorite names for the Holy Spirit. The Helper. It's one of my favorite names. The Helper, Helper and Comforter. But this one in particular. Because there's not a day that goes by where we don't fall into this camp. There's not a day that goes by where we don't need help from the Holy Spirit. And there's not a day that goes by where we don't have access to help either. There's not a day that goes by where we don't have total, full-on access to God and say, Lord, I'm drowning in my sin and I'm drowning because the world hates me. This can weigh on us. This truth can weigh on us. The fact that the world hates you, loathes you, you go and you find no peace and no solace anywhere else in the world, that can weigh on you. And if you don't draw on the help, listen to me, If you're drowning in an ocean and somebody throws you a lifesaver, what are you going to do? You can choose not to take it if you want to. That's so stupid. So, listen, that might be brutal to say, but such is the life of a Christian who doesn't draw on the help of God. What a ridiculous notion. You're starving. You're drowning. You're sinking. The helper is here with you, yet... We don't draw on the help of God. The helper is here to help you along, to give you what you need, to give you everything you you need to live godly. Yet we refuse it. He sends the helper. It's my favorite. There's a couple other words for him. He's the the author of scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16. He's the comforter or the counselor. He's the paraclete. He's the sealer in Ephesians 1. He's our guide in John 16. He's our indweller. He literally lives inside of us in Romans 8. He's a convictor. He convicts the world of sin. And he's also a teacher in John 14. He teaches us. You know, you open up the word of God, the only reason that you can even understand a single solitary word in that whole entire book is because the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. He's the one that wrote this book. Moved on holy men in times of old. But the author of this book is the Holy Spirit. He wrote it. He wrote every word of it and he used holy men to do it. He used men separated and consecrated for this very thing. This is how we get fuel. This is how we get fed. You know, one of the things, and it's a real corny saying that our, you know, our church is spirit-led and Bible-fed. That is how we are healthy. That is how we maintain our health. This is how we maintain our joy. This is how we maintain our success. This is the only offensive weapon that we have against the enemy, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Yet people will refuse to open it, refuse to look into it. Refuse to even be taught by it. Or what they'll do is they'll just kind of like take a couple of little tidbits out of it and just call it a day. And build an entire life around one verse, man. This is why I said this in the beginning. I'm going to say this now. This is why I feel like this church in particular is under a tremendous amount of spiritual warfare and a tremendous amount of pressure. The people that come in here, man, you, I've talked to people that have come in from other churches. They went to other churches for 10, 15 years and their lives are good, really good. Their lives are great. They're 
cruising along, doing their thing, loving Jesus, praying God, praising God, dropping a couple of bucks in the offering plate or, or the bucket or whatever. Dropping a couple bucks in there, man, things are going good. They love Jesus. They're born again. They're, they're saved and they're, they're cool. All of a sudden, they come here and they start hearing the word of God. And, and I, do you have any idea? You can ask Jimmy, any one of the other guys. Anybody. How many times we've had somebody come up to me? How many times have I had somebody come up to me and sit there and say, you know something? I've mer- mo- learned more here in the past three months than I have in 20 years of going someplace else. I've learned more here about the Bible and the Word of God than in 20 years of going someplace else where they're whoop, 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 or doing whatever. 20 years. All right? Listen, I grew up Pentecostal. I'm not killing them. You know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not. But that's what happens. I learned 20 years of, of going someplace else or just reading the Word or by, or on the flip side of that coin, you go to another church that's really staunch, very, very rigid, and all you do is open up the Word of God and there's no spiritual movement whatsoever. No spiritual movement in there whatsoever because they're afraid to actually praise God with holding their hands up. You sinner! Praising Jesus, for clapping. What a silly notion. Leave. They'll throw you right out. They'll kick you right out. Talking in tongues, you psycho babbler. That's what happens. But I'll tell you this. I've seen lives changed by somebody who's led by the Spirit, by the Helper, and they're reading the Word of God. They live their life a certain way for 20 years. All of a sudden, they start applying what they know in the Word of God. They start taking it, really putting it to boots. What do I mean by that? They're putting it to work. Really putting it to work. They're taking the Word of God and they're living by it. They're taking the Word of God and they're really, I mean, giving it some cleats. And then all of a sudden they come to us and they say, my world is exploding. Man, things are just catastrophic. I lost my job. My car exploded. My dog died. Everything is just happening. People are hating me. All of a sudden, my family can't stand me. All of a sudden, these, these things, these things that never, never happened before are starting to happen. People hate me without any, there's no reason for them to hate me. I don't know why they hate me so much. That's this, we, I hear it all the time. What's their problem? I'm like, you got Jesus in you, brother. Amen. That's their problem. You're taking the word of God and you're, you're applying it. You're receiving the help from the helper. The helper is stretching out his hand and you're taking it now. You're not just kind of doing your own thing. You're, you're receiving from the Holy Spirit. You're opening up the word of God. You're being comforted. You're being convicted. You're, you're allowing him to indwell you. You're being taught. You're doing all of the things that the Holy Spirit says that he is. And this is when Jesus really starts to usher in this, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the one who comes. And, and how do we live this life in all the hatred against us and all the warfare on us? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen to me. There is only one way to win. One way. Spiritually. That's it. That's it. But when the Helper comes, in verse 26, and I'll close. When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. You see that? He doesn't just help you with a lot of vain stupidity. He helps you with truth. The Spirit of truth who proceeds right from the Father. He will testify of who? Christ. Me. That's what he says. He's going to testify of me. He's going to testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. That's, that's the ultimate goal of God. You understand? He wants to take you, wants to fix your life, wants to mold things. He wants to get some things straight. He wants to get some things right. I deal with this with broken chains all the time. One of the things I tell everybody is that, yes, he wants, to, he wants to get you clean, wants to get you sober, wants to get you living and walking right, wants to do all these things in your life. But there's a reason behind it. The reason is so that you're useful to him. Hear me on this. Listen, nobody, I just want my life to be better. I just want to have more money in my bank account and have a wife that loves me. Listen to me. The reason why he wants to do this in your life is because he wants you to be useful for him and for his kingdom and for his glory. And he will equip you to do all of those things if that is your motive. If that is your motive, 
He sends you the helper to help you be closer to God so that you can be useful to him, so that you can be a witness. He was telling them all this so that they would go out and know that their job, their job description now is to be a witness of God. Their job description now, it wasn't, he didn't just call me out, to, he didn't just clean me up to sober me up so I'd just be a sober guy now. He called me out and cleaned me up because he wants to make me useful. He wants to make you useful. He wants you to bear witness of him to other people. Hear me on this. Don't dial out. He wants to make you useful to God. Do you want to be that? Do you really want to be that? Because if you do, and that's your, that's your heart, we can leave here today all filled with the Spirit, man. We're going to leave here with the Word of God. We're going to love Jesus. I want to be useful, man. I want to be, you know, storm down the walls for Christ. Cool. That's cool. Allow me to revert to what I said to you before. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If that's really what you want, I'm not saying this to be a downer. One of the things that you want, one of the things that you know and how you know that you're really living a life for Jesus is that you're going to come up against tremendous persecution. Just know that that's what it comes with. But the greatest thing about Jesus is that he tells us this. And he warns them, he warns his disciples about this. And at the end of it, at the end of what I'm telling you, at the end of this, he says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not just going to give you a bunch of marching orders and I'm not going to send you into war with one hand grenade. I'm not just going to send you into war with a little tiny buck knife. I'm, I'm going to send you into war with a full arsenal and all of that. Help on the way. I'm going to send you into war knowing and preparing you and getting you ready to be useful. I'm going to send you into war and I'm going to give you everything that you need to win and to be awesome for God. That's what he's going to do. He gives you everything that we need. Everything that we need, he prepares us and he gives it to us and he doesn't hold anything back. He calls us friends. He doesn't hold anything back from a friend. And even more than that, he calls us sons and daughters. Can you think of your son or your daughter or somebody that you love coming to you and asking you for help, asking you for something, and then all of a sudden, you denying them that? My son comes up to me and says, Dad, I'm starving. I haven't eaten for three days. I don't know, tough. I got a T-bone steak I'm gnawing on. And he's like, I'm, I'm hungry. What type of person would that, that would be? Even the thought of it is, is ridiculous. Ridiculous. He doesn't hold anything back. He's going to give you every single thing that you need. He sends you a helper. He sends the Spirit of God to hold us and to keep us and to guide us and to guide us. What a great truth.